I painted these in the house because it was very cold in the sewing room. There were a couple of uh, rainy days where it was chilly out and I didn't want to turn the heat back on out there. So I painted these in the house and I did a bunch of stitching and I'll show a few highlights from that. I originally was just going to uh, record the whole thing and show it all to you, probably sped up and talk about all the different things between worrying that some people would find that really boring and also um, the fact that I got through stitching the first couple of thread colors and completely filled up my hard drive and needed to throw out a bunch of stuff to even store it on there any longer. I decided I abandoned that plan and I'm just going to show you highlights of doing these designs. And one of the main things is that I don't try to control this process. This is a process of discovery. It's a process of exploration. When I was a kid, a visiting librarian came to our school. It may have been in seventh grade. It may have been in sixth grade when I was still at the elementary school. But at any rate, it was fascinating. This guy came and he talked about a research project he was doing. And he talked about all these different parts of his life where he was running into different things and learning different things and how in the process of research he was discovering that if he pulled this from here and this from there and this little item he'd learned somewhere else uh, just you know co coincidentally he'd learned something about something related and as he pulled it all together he ended up in a completely different place with his research project than he thought he was going when he started. And I've always loved that idea. And in the case of art, I think a big part of veracity is our own reaction to it and our own heart's desire and our eyes and whether things sizzle for us or pop. And I like to do very colorful work. Um, it's sort of my wheelhouse. I don't try to decide where I'm going before I start. I just try to start, you know that saying, a job well started is half done, and then see where I end up going. And so this one in the video, starting the seven purse tops, I just painted these kind of shell shapes like this. So it'd be sort of a spiral, and then I didn't know what I would do with them. I've actually done something less striking with them than I expected. And then I did this other stitching that's pretty typical for me and fairly typical colors. And like I say, one part of it could be used to make some sort of little bag. Um, and then the other part could be used to make something else. I'm not necessarily thinking of this as one project, although it certainly could be if you wanted it to be. It's sort of an odd shape for it to be one. And then I like the backs to be colorful and the stitching on the back to be not too incompetent. Um, this is another one. I just stitched these two leaves and ended up painting those quite a bit. And these sorts of shapes um, that I ended up painting. And I've got a fair amount of different... Uh, this thread color is a kind of a aqua thread and then there's a lot of white and yellow in there too. This one is the artichoke which is one of my typical things and then this bit of the raw edge um, in one of my very favorite fabrics that actually inspired not only the bloom wall hanging but also the original here comes the sun wall hangings and if I could get that fabric still I would buy I'd buy more than one bolt. But anyway, um, these are the peacocks and there aren't really any rivers, but I, one thing I wanted to mention, when I started painting these, I started painting the centerpiece because most of these have three sections. And I started painting not the littlest one, the middle sized one, not the pointed one. And I didn't like it. And you can't really get that out. I mean, you could but that's not the process for me. The process is really to keep moving and see where you go. And so one of the things that I do, it might annoy other people, but I, I don't, when I notice I'm making a mistake, 
I don't make myself crazy trying to fix it. I just switch to what I do want to do. So these two are different than all these others where I'm doing what I want. And, and it works for me. It may not for other people. And the other thing, I don't like to do a flat color most of the time. So this has a lot of sort of a rust, a metallic -y rust mixed in with this metallic -y gold. Same thing up here where I had stenciled this with a fair amount of orange in the gold. And so when I painted, I introduced an orange color. And this is done with ink and this is done with paint. I'm not sure you need to really, I think you could use all ink or all paint and probably work, it would work out okay. I'm, I just have both and so I tend to use both. You know, you want to use these supplies up before they get so old and dried out that they're just going to go in the landfill. Um, I'm not sure how successful this is. I kind of did these hearts and then I stitched um, some empty hearts that I drew with chalk so that I could kind of make heart shapes coming down and there's a little bit of peacock going on everywhere and different thread colors. And these are those kind of seed pods I think of them as but I make them with a uh, 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 single hole punch in the side of the wallpaper when I make the stencils. And I'll put links to related videos below um, for people that would like to look back at those techniques. It's sort of hard for me to reshoot how to cut the stencil in every single video where I might use one. and. Um, and I think boring for people that took that in the first time. So I'll just refer you back to previous videos and have you, I'll, I'll try to put a link that jumps you right to the pertinent section if it's a much longer video and then just shows that part. Um, but anyway, I'm not sure how effective this is. I then did these sort of dripping hearts out of this brown fabric and then I've outlined them a bit on this side and this gold doesn't show up so much up here. And I considered adding some brown to this as I went up so that it would pop more and over here as well. And then it, it takes so long to paint these. It's, I didn't even decide not to do it, I just forgot. I could always add that later if I really wanted to. As long as it was still at a point where I had enough access to that section of the design to heat set it again. Because the next thing I'll do when I take these out to the sewing room is heat set the whole thing. This one is probably my favorite and I'm not sure that purple actually sells that well. It's my husband's favorite color so I usually do a lot of purple and it may be fine for purses. I haven't you know really kept records where I tease out the colors of things. I've made a lot of purple purses and they're all gone and um, I've made some purple uh, kitchen stuff and probably had to put it on clearance to get rid of it. So it's different depending on what things are for, what colors work. Um, I don't know, I, I just, I like all that's going on here. This thread color I wanted to mention isn't purple. It's actually rust. I felt like there was enough of a, a rusty color coming through here to justify um, using the rust thread and because I, I like I like orange and pink together and I like purple and rust together and that's just the way it is and so I've added a lot of things and like I say I don't necessarily think of this as going to be this is going to be a purse I think more in terms of maybe this top will, would fold in half and then it would have design front and back or Maybe it could have a front like this and the back could actually be where the bottom's leather and reaches up and goes in the back. And I have to decide if there's fabric inside the leather or if those join um, in some neat way that's stable and also um, shows the work but doesn't have an inside of the bag that is unpleasant in any way. And of course, once these are attached to leather, the entire thing, you can surface scrub this part a little bit. And so I'm thinking ahead to 
you know, you take a bag that where you've heat set everything and it's washable, at least hand washable, you add leather to it and then it's not anymore. And what does that do? And how, what is the life expectancy of a little cosmetic bag and at the price range that I'll be selling it at? And is that gonna be acceptable to people? It just pleases my eyes to look at things that are very well made. And so I try to make what I'm making be well made. And I try to recognize when what I'm doing is not gonna result in that. And you know, like the little prototypes I made in the video, I think in the end I made six different leather and cork things. There's not a single one of those that I would put out for sale because none of them are up to my own standards for stuff that I sell, um, including just because they're sewn with jeans thread, which is what I had. I have other uh, nylon thread for sewing leather now that I'll use. Um, going forward and then there's this one I think uh, then there's this one I think most of it makes it into the shot but this to me is the best part and I definitely want to add a center that pops and I don't know what color I'm sort of seeing black you could have a black leather center it would also be an opportunity to cut a leather piece that was you know maybe cut it with your pinking shears so that it's uh, sort of serrated around the edge and make it you know vaguely circular and then put something in the center maybe even a button you know I mean I don't know I'll, I'll start looking around and experimenting and just set things on there and really what I'm going for is does it please my eyes if I put buttons on there are they now going to catch on things if the purse has a strap that say it's made of parachute cord, a long strap, and it catches on the buttons, how annoying is that gonna be? I think that's gonna be pretty annoying. So usually I only put buttons on a type of like a tote where you've got a thick strap that's either leather or cloth and it's not gonna catch on the buttons. But I might put some beading on something uh, using this really strong Nymo thread that uh, has the potential for a cord to drag across that because as long as they're not sharp beads, which some beads are very sharp, um, it, it'll be okay. It, I've tried to stop using the sharp beads, but when I have used them, I've only used them on a wall piece where it's not getting a lot of wear and tear. So, and a few of these places aren't stitched and uh, sometimes I like to leave those blank areas and sometimes I'll come back and do something in them. It really just depends. And there's a big question in my mind of whether or not after I heat set, I'm going to pre-wash. Pre-washing does, you lose some body in the piece and that's going to affect how it feels as it connects to the leather. And I used to scotch guard all my purses and it was actually, it looked pretty cool. I'd wear a mask and I'd, uh, I'd scotch guard outside and I'd hang them in the trees and bushes down the side of the house. And I, I wish I'd taken pictures because they looked pretty neat, but I don't think I ever did. And I doubt my husband did either. And if, if he did, it, they're lost on some old phone probably. But um, anyway, I do like, if I brush these with a nail brush and trim them, there's only so much fray that you're gonna get with that even if you brush them vigorously it's it's just sort of nicer and then everything kind of does that and so I'm I'm just trying to decide I'm almost wondering if I could investigate something I have a nice Dooney and Burke purse that's uh, like a coated treated canvas I believe along with leather and I wonder if I could find a way to treat this whole thing once it's done that wouldn't ruin the fray part but that would stiffen and so I'm thinking about a lot of things I'm not sure where I'm going to end up I know that where if I continue this pursuit where I am in two years will be completely different than where I am now and certain things will have happened um, that took me in a different trajectory than I expected and, and I'm open to that process. And then there's this one, which is sort of, <laughs> sort of weird. 
this is just the artichoke and it's got various things going on and I really like this subtle uh, greenish gold in this fabric a lot but when I did this in green I had no idea when I sat down to paint that I would end up sort of mimicking this color of gold I was actually going for a light green well, I started out wanting a dark green, but the paints I had weren't lending themselves to that. And then I thought, well, I'll do a light green. But this is what I kept mixing on my little palette. And then I realized, oh, it's that color I like. So I decided to go for it. And one thing um, it may not be effective in your mind, but one thing I do is I wanted some of these little bits of color inside of this. This stenciling is a little sloppy and I'm inclined to just ignore it. Sometimes I've painted them straighter, but um, you know with decorating or fixing up your house I used to tell friends because uh, we've always worked on uh, houses and done a lot of stuff over the years, but um, I used to say I find that if you can take the three things you really don't like about a room and change them uh, so that you do like them, so they become positives, you're gonna like the whole room. You know, I, I, I just never had a room that was bad enough that there were more than three obvious issues. And um, so anyway, I, I feel like distraction is sometimes enough. And so even though this little bit of stenciling isn't what you'd call perfect, um, I'm inclined to say it's still a cool design and and I've always been fascinated in my life how you can look at something and say like, wow that's really cool and then you look closer and you notice oh there are flaws and I don't find more appreciation in looking at something and seeing how it's completely meticulously perfect it's a hundred percent perfection and then I like it more. I actually have always tended towards this idea that, you know, I learned not that long ago, really, in the scheme of things, is the idea of wabi-sabi. It's the imperfection that makes the whole perfect. I've always gravitated that way. I've never liked the idea of um, something having a flaw and therefore being garbage thrown away. I think sometimes the flaw and the, the worn out part and the well used um, qualities in an item are what add some of the beauty. And then there are sometimes that things are made in a way that uh, that as they wear, they, they start to look trashy, and, and that's not the kind of craftsmanship that I appreciate. And it's a subtle difference, and maybe it's different for everyone. I added these shapes, and I like these, but I don't know that they'll end up on the same piece together. It may be that this ends up to be one thing, this ends up to be another, I don't know. But I wanted to show you something I did along the way. I didn't do it down here because I didn't like it when I did it up top. But if I get in closer, I'm hoping you can see. So I went around, I did this kind of part that sometimes has reminded people of antlers on some things that I've done. And then I came back with this green and did it here and also underneath here. And the thing is, I don't mind it here. I really don't care for this. And it's just something I wanted to mention. We don't always like everything we make. And we don't always like it at a certain point. And then as we figure out problem solving what to do, we might turn it into something that we like a lot. And so it's possible that in constructing something out of this, I'll end up liking this. But for right now, I don't, I don't care for that green line, the way that I've done that. And 
That's why this top section of this bag is going to be my first project. I'm going to take some portion of this and I'm going to put leather on the bottom and I'm going to make something that will likely be somehow similar to this, but I think probably bigger and maybe with boxed corners, maybe more an appropriate size for a sort of a cosmetic bag and um, with brown or black leather. That's what I'm envisioning right now as my first prototype that incorporates uh, the quilted purse top with the leather. Now, this took me, I started on this on Saturday and it's now Thursday and I don't have a whole video presentation of this, but I'm going to spend the next day and a half attempting to give you sort of a tour of what I did to make these. What I wanted to tell you about the ordering the boot stitcher is that there were very many of them listed on Amazon. And as you know, I've been beating everybody over the head with the fact that I've become an Amazon associate. But I wanted to let you know that the reason we picked the one we did, and the reason we jumped in and did it, the listing was Prime with free returns. It had a little coupon and was scheduled to arrive quickly with needles and nylon thread so that I could start playing with it immediately. And we've noticed in the last year or so that Amazon has made returns so fault-free and streamlined we never order anything planning to return it, but the boot stitcher can be returned if it doesn't turn out to be something that I can use to make stuff. I am trying to make enough money to keep the channel going, to make it worth doing, 